space. Uh, we're going to start exactly 10 minutes from now. Uh, we shall be waiting for co-host, uh, our main speaker, Collins, and every other person that will be joining. My brother, uh, we're waiting for about 10 minutes, exactly 10 minutes, actually, to officially begin the space. I'll be making you speaker, and uh, we shall be waiting a bit. Uh, if you can, please share the link with your circles and you know your friends let them join the space this is a recorded space so everything we shall discuss shall be recorded and uh, people can be able to listen in in case they miss out on anything it's good to see you man Karibu, I see you, Barbara. It's good to have you in the space. Uh, we are waiting for exactly eight minutes to start the space. We're just waiting for Sample to join in. Share the link if you can with your friends in your different circles. Uh, the space will be starting in exactly eight minutes from now. It's good to see you guys. Good to see you too, man. Mr. Dean, I see you on the space as well. Uh, we start in eight minutes. Share the link with your friends if you can. Yeah, yeah, we're starting soon in eight minutes. Uh, okay, guys, um, as we wait for other people to start to, to, to join in, six minutes to go, uh, I think we can have a recap of last week. If you were part of the EAT space last week, we're talking to Ivan Chibuka and Alvaro Tevajwa, Team Arudem. Uh, these are gamers building the first esports company in Uganda and one of the first in East Africa. It was a very interesting conversation. We talked not only gaming, but also the importance of branding for startups and, you know, the importance of building the right team, and especially 
when you're building an idea that's contrary and it's 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 something different. And Ivan did share a lot. I've always shared a lot. In case you missed anything, uh, you can uh, check out the recording, the recorded space on my on my handle, or you can check out our YouTube channel. We try to drop them there. I think my biggest takeaway last week was um, uh, uh, the importance of branding. Really, the way I've explained it. Whatever you're building, however small, however crazy, how you brand it is very important because it's how you communicate to the world or to the people that you're trying to sell your brand to or your product to, what really you're trying to do. So yeah, uh, very interesting space, very good conversation. You can check it out and learn one or two things. My co-host Irene is having some issues, I think, with her internet. But yeah, we start in... Four minutes exactly. If you've just joined the space, we, today we are talking to the big man, Collins, uh, CEO, uh, co-founder of WAPI, and currently I don't know if he's still a COO, but yeah, he's a co-founder of WAPI. He's a software developer, software engineer, and he's doing some great stuff in the tech space, you know, uh, tech software space. And tonight he will be sharing some uh, some good insights about the technology, software technology space, but also, you know, some of the experiences he's had so far building his career in this space. Very, very glad to have you, Collins, and everyone that's joining in. Very glad to have you guys. We start in four minutes from now. And yeah, you can share the link with your friends to join in as well. This is a recorded space, so in case anyone joins in later on, they will, can still listen to the uh, the conversation that we had earlier. Um, okay, uh, we start, I think, in exactly one minute from now. Uh, I think I'll introduce the space and uh, introduce myself and then invite my co-host to do the same. Then we shall have call-ins after that. So this is the EAT space. Uh, this is the people's space. We do this every week. Just ordinary people coming together to discuss the future, uh, sorry, to discuss the topics, social and economic topics that are shaping the future of East Africa and Africa. We have this uh, conversation because we think it's important to have these conversations, to challenge ourselves to be and do better, and just to discuss these things that are really shaping the future around us and just to get engaged, but also in many ways to um, celebrate uh, Africans that are moving Africa and Collins is one of them. And this is important because there's so many young people across East Africa that are trying to do things or are doing things. And just knowing that there's a person your age or you know in your age bracket or just a young person doing something big and knowing that story can do a lot to push you on your personal journey and you know just to keep you moving. So in the EAT space, we have these conversations and uh, tech 
and software uh, is one of that very one of those very important social and economic topics because it falls in both uh, both, uh, both both the aspects. And tonight we shall be discussing uh, that technology and also Colin sharing his story. My co-host Irene is still having issues; she's off. So I think I'll go straight to introduce myself. Then I'll invite Colin. Um, I'm Frederick Cascazzini. I'm passionate about East Africa and Africa, and I'm an entrepreneur. And I'm very glad to be part of this conversation tonight. Uh, I'll invite Mr. Collins to introduce himself. Collins, uh, as you come to introduce yourself, uh, I think I'll also go into my first question. So we want to know who Collins is, and also we want to know how did we get here to be hosting you tonight as a CEO or P, but also um, a young uh, Ugandans, a young Ugandan thriving in the uh, software technology space. You're welcome, Collins. All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, the name is Collins Mbola Chalo, as I've been introduced. And to give a brief snippet into who Collins is, um, currently I am a software engineer, but also a co founder of a startup called WAPI. Uh, but to give a brief story to a brief uh, backstory to that is my journey initially started out, uh, I'd say, my most important parts of my story that led up to where I am today started out right after senior six vacation. Um, after getting basically six points at USCE uh, and being probably destined to not get into any university or not get any course, uh, it was a very eye-opening moment for me, but also a very pivotal moment in understanding what exactly defines uh, success or what exactly defines making it in life, right? So after getting those six points during vacation, um, I was looking for work to do and looking for things to do. Uh, when I happened to land on this small gig, which was a very, very weird gig of basically doing salesmanship or hawking from place to place. And through that first opportunity, uh, I was able to then jump into this office where I landed my next job. But to give context, I was pretty much like any other average person who either doesn't have connections, doesn't know a lot of people, um, and you're just trying to make a way of making sure that ends meet or end something. So I took that first opportunity that I got of doing salesmanship or hawking. And from there, I was then opened up to this other whole other opportunity into an industry that I was more passionate about, which was technology, because I basically reached at this office, pitched to them and told them, um, what I'm selling, and they were impressed by that. And then through that, they gave me the opportunity to explore working as an IT support specialist. So that was my very, very first tech job. Um, and this was during Essex vacation. I hadn't yet gone to university. I was basically, I think, two months or one month into my vacation. And yeah, I ended up getting this job as an IT support specialist uh, using the knowledge I had learned from school, uh, through computer classes, but also personal uh, learning. From there, I then um, luckily got this scholarship from Udacity. Not a very big scholarship, but like these course scholarships where you see, for example, I think Alt School is giving out a lot of those course scholarships for people to go and learn programming and all these other things. So yeah, I got a scholarship which was run by Udacity and Google to teach people programming online uh, through Adela. And from there, I then met this gentleman who was called Matthew and was my assigned mentor to learn through that course. And Matthew was the person that then convinced me that, hey, you know what? You're passionate about tech. You're really good at it. You should actually now venture into programming or software engineering. Uh, at the time, I was about uh, 18, turning 19. And he managed to convince me at that point that if, if I was able to get into software engineering at the time, I would make a killing. Um, from there, I took the next one month or two to teach myself software engineering using a platform called Code Academy. And with Code Academy, within one month, I then was ready to basically at least write very basic programs. And through those programs, I applied to join Andela. Uh, for those who do not know Andela, Andela is, is one of the biggest technology companies across Africa and probably right now across the world when it comes to software engineering talent. So at the time, Andela was like one of the hardest places to get into. Um, and it was 
hold the Harvard of Africa when it comes to software engineers. But within that time, I tried to definitely push myself to learn programming. I started out with a language called Python and then uh, practiced Python for one month using Code Academy to prepare myself for the interviews that were set up uh, at Andela. The first interview came. I basically did this interview while at my workplace by then where I was doing the IT support. Uh, I remember doing it during one of my night shifts uh, with a friend of mine called Frank who was also around during that shift and then I called Daniel and I was basically very, very scared, uh, but it was about a 35-minute interview. Did the interview. Uh, luckily, I completed it and passed and went on to do a couple of other interviews and then a boot camp and then eventually getting into Andela uh, within my second month of programming. Now, it was a very interesting journey because before that, a couple of months back, I had no idea on how to program, apart from maybe HTML and CSS, which was it is basically a markup language or not even an actual programming language. Uh, but through those two months, teaching myself how to program and really wanting to get this opportunity pushed me to then like have the conviction to have day and night uh, teaching myself programming and getting t- into Andela. Now, Andela, I would say, is where opportunities really started opening for me, uh, not only because of Andela's reputation, but because of... Uh, the way we were taught how to do programming. But we'll dive more into that as we go through the question. So yeah, so fast tracking through Andela, I work at Andela. Then I get my next opportunity working with a US company called Blossom. And then from Blossom, uh, I get to work with another US company called uh, Midebo Inc., which was like one of the biggest clinical trials companies. Uh, and they did such amazing work during the COVID-19 period. And then from Midebo, uh, I got to work with a company called Get Start, uh, which was US and Hong Kong based. And then from Get Start, I get to work with another company called Pareto, uh, which was US based. Uh, while also working with Pareto, I work with another US company called Anamiva. Um, and then most recently, I get to work with another US company called uh, Time Payments. And finally, my most recent employer, which is Archetype, which I'm loving. Uh, that I'm currently working with. And all these companies that I've been working with have been US-based companies. So yeah, that's pretty much my journey from uh, a person who was doing basically hooking and uh, salesmanship to a, what some would call it, I guess, world-class uh, software engineer uh, who is still learning the craft. Thank you. Fantastic, fantastic, fantastic story. I think already if you've just joined in, it, it must be blowing your mind hearing a man coming from Hawking to becoming a big, big, big time software engineer. Thank you, Collins. Um, uh, I want to understand something. Uh, you talk about uh, you getting that exposure uh, with the opportunities that uh, were, were in tech and being convinced that between 18 so is it said 19 to 20 to get into the, the software space uh, being convinced around the time I want to know what's your relationship with uh, with software coding and technology in general at what age you know were you exposed to this was it earlier on as a child or it's just something that you know you bumped into around that that period of time when you're done with uh, form six and trying to join campus yeah um, I would say I was <laughs> yeah and Maybe this might sound as much of a lie, but I would say it was something that I think came naturally, uh, which doesn't make sense, but that's how it really was for me because my first exposure to a computer was probably around primary six or primary seven, but that was during school and would have like 15, 30 minutes to use these computers and all we're doing was playing games and that was it. Then I'd say my most serious uh, encounter with a computer came around senior two or secondary where we basically had, uh, there was this Microsoft competition called Microsoft Office Specialist. And it was this acclaimed international competition. uh, And I happened to be selected as one of the people to represent my school uh, internationally to participate in this competition. But this wasn't really computer or technology to say. It was really just playing around with Microsoft Excel, Microsoft Word, and all these other things. But I'd say that's for me where I felt all my journey with knowing that, oh, cool, I'm actually really good at this, started from uh, playing around with Microsoft Excel and Microsoft Word to then go ahead and be selected for that competition. From there onwards uh, to Senior 3 and Senior 4, whenever they were teaching us these things of like HTML, CSS during the computer class, 
because I did computer and art uh, for my for my selection selection subjects in O level, I was also basically really picking up these things so easily, and I would be able to like write the HTML and CSS quite easily at the time while they were teaching it to us. So from there onwards, again, took it up in A level when I did it as a subsidiary. And in A level, if I'm being honest, I think I only attended like one or five classes throughout the two years, uh, but ended up getting the D1 in computer, which is why I say I think it was just something that was natural for me at the time. But continuous use and practice while uh, even out of class and like playing around with computers, figuring out things, playing around with plat- with things like Adobe. Uh, and by that time, some thing called Magic, something for pictures were, yeah, my initial experiences with a computer to then get me into programming uh, later on when I had a chat with Matthew. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, fantastic. Uh, uh, I think... Uh... That time now when you're with Matthew and, you know, you're telling me about the opportunity and I feel like it was a roller coaster and then getting into Andela, uh, I'd like to understand, do you feel like besides, you know, the opportunity that came across, um, what personal uh, what personal attributes or um, what level of discipline did it take you to actually be able to grasp uh, these software languages at the pace you're grasping it? Uh, and you know, being able then to do that interview told us that got you, you know, got you in. What what level of discipline did you have around that time, and what other um, what other personal attributes helped you to scale that fast and effectively take advantage of the opportunity? Yeah, uh, I think that's an amazing question. It was two things, uh, at least from what I can recall. One, having a goal in sight is something that's very, 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 very important towards like getting yourself to do something. And for me, at the time that goal in sight were two things. Uh, Matthew's promise of like, yo, if you get into software engineering right now, you're like 18. By the time you're 19, you're going to be earning crazy money. If I'm being honest, the prospect of earning a lot of money was very, very interesting and very, very tempting. So that was uh, drive number one. But second, also really getting into this field was something that I'd always wanted to do. Uh, but because I'd gotten six points at USCE, I knew that I couldn't get into Makerere or any of these other universities to now study software engineering. So that meant I had no, also no other option but than just teaching myself software engineering, right? So having those two things pretty much drove me so much. And the discipline then now came in while I was at this workplace because at the time... I didn't have a personal computer and I was using the computer of the workplace that I was working at. Uh, So I would work basically two shifts, the afternoon shift and the night shift so that I have more access to the computer to enable me basically get enough time to learn this programming language. So I had to put in both the work and time because of a constraint on resources, but also because I really also wanted to have a good life and make good money as a software engineer. Good, good, good. Uh, thank you, Collins. And I think I remember, uh, I think it was 2019, meeting you at, at Andela. And I remember the energy that uh, is so first hand when I met you there. But uh, I think I'll invite my co-host, Irene. She has some questions too. Irene, if you can hear me, uh, you can you can, you can can ask Chris, Colin something before we continue. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Irene Sumara. I think I didn't introduce myself. I had in, um, network issues. But yeah, this is a space we run every week. I am Kaskazini coming up with new topics, you know, for more enlightening, but also the stories that people give um, give us, they are really inspiring, just like the one that Collins is really trying to, to, to make us understand. Yeah, so um, Collins, that's a very inspiring story. And, you know, you being on the tech um, journey, making it to the tech industry. I would like to know uh, what is WAPE? How did it start? Why? And yeah, what is WAPE exactly? Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Irene. So WAPE is a product pretty much of the experiences me and my friends went through during vacation and after vacation. 
So when I joined that company uh, that I got into after I basically was doing hawking and selling, and this person was very impressed, I got into this company, uh, and to give more background into that story mm-hmm. is, I was basically selling uh, potato and charcoal when I was doing the hawking. And I would move, I went to this building, which is now called Nakar Business Park. And this one gentleman in this very, very fancy office was really impressed with a pitch that I gave him. I saw to him the charcoal and potato. He did not buy the charcoal and potato, but he bought the pitch I saw to him, right? So he gave me that job and opportunity, not because he knew me, not because uh, I had a degree, not because I had this huge experience, but because at that time I exhibited that skill that he found to be very useful. So that's really where the journey of WAPI begins from, right? Um, from there, I get my friends uh, some work opportunities within the same company. And then we constantly have a lot of our other friends reaching out to us, asking, hey, can you give me some work? Can you help me get this job? And we really have nothing to do for them uh, because we don't have that much access to the opportunities. Yet these ideally are wonderful people who have so much potential, but just don't have access to these opportunities. So... A couple of months down the road when I've gotten into Andela uh, and I think fast tracking down to like early 2020 or late 2019, I kept thinking about this and I was like, hey, you know what? I really, really need to at least be able to have to be able to do something uh, about creating a platform that gives people access to opportunities. So early 2020, I meet up with most of my friends again who are working with at this company. And we talk about this whole idea and uh, I brief, brief them about really the prospect of the job market in Uganda and East Africa in general is very broken. You either need to know someone, you either need to have experience, you either need to have a degree to maximize your potential of getting a job. How about if we created a decentralized access to those opportunities? We create a platform where people, regardless of their experience, where they come from or what, are able to get access to these opportunities just based on their skills rather than all these three things. And that's really where the name WAPI actually also comes from, right? We were like, each and every time someone needs to tell you that you need experience, you need a degree, or you need to know someone to get a job, we want to say WAPI. That's not it. WAPI, you don't really need to have that. So that's how we really got the name WAPI, and that's how WAPI came through, with the idea that how can we make access to opportunities uh, very decentralized, but more specifically focusing on digital skills uh, and technology-based work. Thank you, Collins. Uh, talking about WAPI, uh, I remember again, I think it was still 2019, uh, we meet and you still tell, you're talking about WAPI just in theory that, that time and uh, talking about the opportunities you, ident- you had identified in the market and why we needed something like WAPI. My question is, um, how much and how long did it take you uh, with, with, from that period of time when you thought about it as an idea and then bring it into a company that's coming up, how long did it take you? How much did it, did it take you to get it off the ground? And what can you say was uh, the most important uh, aspect or most important factor that was able to move WAPI from zero to getting on the road? Yeah, um, I think between the time we talked and probably when I first thought about it, it was probably one year because we, no, actually, wait, it was more than one year because I remember when I was signing my Andela contracts, yeah. uh, there's basically this section where you have to include all previous IP or things that you've thought about before you join the company. And I remember actually listing out, it wasn't, I didn't yet called it WAPI by the, at the time, but I remember listing out something where I said, uh, create a platform or create something that connects people to job opportunities. And that was, I think, 2018, August. So maybe two months before that, maybe 2018, June or July, was when I first thought about WAPI. But bringing that from that thought to an actual uh, thing that then takes its own life started in 2020 when I had conversations with my friends and and, uh, my co-founders. So in all honesty, what got WAPI from just the thought to what it is now has been majorly the people who are there from that day onwards, right? The belief that they put in it and the work that was constantly kept putting in uh, from the day it started. Beyond that, how we started it out, uh, the initial capital that we started with was, I I think it was about, um, hmm, I'm sure I remember the amount, but it was about either th- between one to three million 
uh, that we all basically sort of had to gather around and then bring it in. But in all honesty, that money was like never brought in all at once. Like we just started with what we had at the time to get it off the ground. And then uh, it, it kept pushing through and through. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so that's really how we got it from an idea into what it is today with the people and like a lot of belief from them. Okay, thank you. And I think we should all still ask more questions about WAP later on. But trying to get back a bit uh, to, you know, your personal journey growing through uh, Pandela and all that. You've told us that all the companies you've worked for are in the U.S., which means that you do work virtually. How has, it, what, how has the experience been like for you working in Kampala, uh, but working for companies in the U.S.? And uh, just how much did Andela, because you said Andela, the way you guys were taught, uh, coding and all that was quite instrumental in your journey moving forward. So what was different about your experience at Andela that did then, you know, propel you forward and how has the experience been like for you working virtually? Yeah. Um, I think Andela honestly set, set us up for success from the get go because, and it was very unconventional, uh, maybe just because this was my second workplace, but I'm pretty sure not all Ugandan workplaces are like that. So we get in our first week, you'd expect that, A, first day you're in, you're supposed to start work, start pushing code and all these other things. But at Andela, it was very different. For about the first two weeks, we basically weren't pushing any code. And for the first two weeks, we were just learning communication, work ethic, uh, remote work. How do you get onto a Zoom call? How do you uh, communicate on a Zoom call? Uh, where do you look when you're talking on a Zoom call? And a pro tip, Whenever you're on a video call, always try to look at the green light, right? That way you actually, the person you're talking to is actually seeing you. So many of these things, are you in a noisy environment? Uh, how are you communicating? How are you keeping your stakeholders ready? Because in remote work, the biggest thing that will set you apart is communication, right? In a place where someone can't see what you're doing, how you communicate how you're doing it is very, very important. So learning all that from Mandela is what I, would, I believe has enabled me continuously work with U.S. companies and jump from one company to another by like just being hired. Hey, come, we're taking you to this one. So that's how I think Andela set me up for success, right? And beyond that, it was also a lot of the actual technical skills that they taught us. Um, in universities, or unless this has changed, but you find that so much of the universities are teaching languages that are either obsolete or not necessarily marketable when it comes to software engineers. In Andela, the skills and languages that were being taught to us taught to us were those that were actually in demand. Like you're being taught something because there's a client waiting on the line to hire you, or there are some folks who are looking for engineers within that specific language. So that's why I think, uh, yeah, it was like very pivotal. And those are some of the skills that I take on up to today and also try to pass on to some of the folks that we have at WAPI. Good, good. Uh, I think you've, you've not answered the next question, the, uh, the question of working virtually and what your experience has been. But as you answer that, uh, you talked about the difference in the, language, the languages that you guys are taught at Andela. But I think, you know, as a person in the tech space that we have so many young people, not just in Uganda, but across East Africa, that do study technology somewhere, somehow in universities, they do not get the opportunities, usually after school, to work in the companies they imagine to work you know, what would you, what, what, where do you think the problem is besides the languages they're taught? Why don't these young people actually get opportunities to work in the technology space? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I'll also first answer the other question. How has it been working uh, virtually? I'd say it's, it's been a very interesting experience, um, but I would say I wouldn't, I wouldn't give it up for any other experience. Like, I wouldn't give it up for a nine to five. Uh, any other day right because of the freedom that comes with it because of the i would say the exposure that you get by working with all these different cultures because of the things that you get to learn uh, by working with people who are building world-class uh, tools and technologies which you can also pretty much do here uh, while working with other companies in uganda or in africa in general so i think Remote work is one of the best ways to get to learn a lot of things from uh, different people in different areas of the country. And for me, it's been an amazing experience also in terms of like, hey, cool, uh, I'm a software engineer and I'm able to like get this lifestyle uh, that makes me feel good and enjoy 
in a way that I know I'm working, but at the same time, I'm not going to be hyper stressed because I'm earning little money or like having to be my nine to five waking up at eight. So it's something I enjoy very, very greatly having the flexibility of sleeping in, working late hours, and yeah, just being able to clock in anytime I want. Now, to the other question of uh, why are some of the folks who are within tech not exactly getting into these opportunities and why are they struggling? I'd say it's it's a mix of uh, a couple of things. Uh, one of those things being the fact that tech is honestly actually crowded, right? Um, there are a lot of people right now within the tech space who at least have some idea of something related to tech, but they may not necessarily, again, like I said, have the skills that are in demand, right? So that's one of the key important things. It's one thing to be able to... And, I'll use an example of programming languages, then I'll also use a real-life example. It's one thing to be able to program in a language like Pascal or, uh, and for anyone who does C-sharp or any of those, no offense, but C-sharp and C++ and all these other things. And it's one, it's another thing to be able to program in like Node.js, Python, R, Go, uh, and all these other languages. It's pretty much the way you would also look at the same way we had folks who used to work in industries. And you had these people who are running all these machines. And then you also had, and I think yeah, the, actually the best example I can give is when we had people who were doing special hire back in the day when you'd ha- you need to have your guy who you give a call, your special hire guy, you call him and then he's charging you these insane fees and you really have nothing to do about it. And then today when we have folks who have then adapted to ride healing platforms like Safecar, like Uber, like Lolo and all these other things, it's pretty much the same those special hire guys who remained in that field of being like hey i only work by people who call me i don't use these platforms pretty much find it hard to get customers now so that's area number one like are the skills you have relevant to the industry are you actually making sure that what you're learning is marketable or able to get you a job right i think that's also important and people sometimes don't consider that while getting into tech The second thing also comes down to really, as an individual, at the end of the day, regardless of how really good you are, regardless of how talented and how gifted you are, people's skills, soft skills matter. They matter so, so much, more than you could even imagine. I would say the reason I've been able to jump from job to job uh, while still being needed at most of the places I've left is not because I'm the best engineer out there. I'm not like the smartest guy on the block. But it's just that I've been able to harness and like use people as a way to like create value, uh, not being in a workplace and just being there because I want to put in the work, but also trying to create meaningful relationships, having soft skills, being uh, proactive and a couple of these things. So it's a mix of those two things. But I think at the end of the day, it also really comes down to are you also putting in the work, uh, honestly, like Soft skills, um, the skill you actually have can also go a long way. But at the same time, I think also hard work is also a key thing in this. So, yeah, not slacking, not putting down the pedal and being like, hey, I'm comfortable. I've done this. Let's let's go. I'm going to be good for all this period. Uh, Yeah, those are some of the things that really would set you apart and help you. Thank you. Uh, Guys, if you just joined the EAT space, we're talking to... Collins Mbola Chalo, a uh, software engineer that's uh, working in Kampala, actually that's stationed in Kampala, but working globally in the technology and software space. Uh, you can ask a question, you can request to ask a question, you'll be allowed to speak or probably share an experience. But yeah, uh, so we move on, Collins. Um, you've talked about uh, the importance of soft skills and um, not just uh, saying, okay, I've learned software, I've learned tech, I should get a job. Talking about soft skills, um, I noticed that you have a personal brand. You know, I've looked at your LinkedIn, I've looked at your social media handles recently. I saw you celebrating, uh, you know, getting verified on Twitter, getting the blue tick. Yeah. Uh, how important has it been uh, building? How important is it to build a personal brand in this kind of space, the technology and software space? How important is it to build a personal brand that then, you know, uh, gets you into other opportunities? Uh, I think it's like 300% or like 100% important, mostly in today's, uh, like today's spaces, right? Um, and 
truth truth be told, I think it's something that I'm also still struggling with or have taken a slack on. Uh, earlier in the year, I was very active with my LinkedIn and my Twitter and building this community and brand, but I've slacked back a bit on it. But to really just get back to your question, I think building a personal brand is very important. Not only because you create a community of loyal customers or loyal people who are then able to buy into whatever you're selling, but I think it's, it also communicates a lot uh, in regards to what you stand for, right? Um, and why that's important is, I think, I don't remember if it was, I think it was Martin Luther King who said this, uh, if, if someone doesn't stand for something, then they'll fall for anything, right? So your personal brand sets you apart and gives you like this stand, this positioning within a certain industry, within a certain sphere of knowledge, right? And with that, you're then able to mobilize masses. You're then able to create a customer fan base that are willing to buy into whatever you're selling. That is why I think a lot of the WAPI community are really either people who have seen what my co-founders and I and the people are doing on Twitter or on social media, or they are people who just uh, understand and would want to learn more about take or opportunities or jobs. So I think that contributes very, very much to uh, how exactly you're building a business or how exactly you're building uh, something that's monetizable. So, yeah, uh, I'd say very, very important. How to go about it differs in, in, in like different spheres. But yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and I, I wanted to know that how, like in your personal experience and the work you've done so far in building your personal brand, what advice would you give, you know, a young you know, tech uh, developer or someone in the tech space that really wants to, you know, build their personal brand and get, you know, attract, you know, some, some, some good opportunities? Yeah, I would say um, talk a lot and share a lot of what you do. Again, for clarity, I am struggling with this personally, but I think it's something that's very, very important. Sharing a lot of what you do, even as small as you might think it is, right? So, for example, let's say you're a graphics designer or you're a, uh, you're a video content creator. And I would like to send a shout out to like uh, one of my friends, Lucky, Simply Lucky. Lucky, I think earlier this month or last month, went out and like shared this tweet of like, hi guys, uh, my name is Simply Lucky and I shoot videos or I do video content and a video content creator and all these other things. That tweet alone that he sent out has got him massive opportunities, right? But all he simply did was just tell people, hi guys, this is what I do uh, and this is how I do it. And he shared a snippet of it. So if you're an engineer, if you're a graphics designer, keep doing that. Once you have some sort of work out there that you think is shareable, share it outside there. Let people know about it. I think for me, what I've been doing a lot of is sharing about speaking engagements, sharing about the things we're doing as WAPI uh, in as much as I can. It's not as good as it ought to be, but I think that's the one step, constantly sharing what you're doing and why, how you're learning and how you're evolving. And I think one of the best places for doing this are Twitter and LinkedIn. Capitalize on Twitter and LinkedIn, mostly within the professional spheres. If you're more of a visual person, uh, Instagram would be an amazing place. TikTok is also an, another amazing place for doing more visual work and content and creating this brand. But that's one of the things. Share a lot of information and knowledge within that specific area that you're an expert uh, in. Um, the other thing is also doing a lot of collaborations. Like collaborate with other folks who are within the same space. That way you're not only appealing to audiences that are reachable through you, but you're also appealing to people who are outside of your sphere of reach, right? So that's also another way to get yourself out there, doing collaborations. Because through collaborations, I think WAPI has also been able to get some customers through our collaboration with companies like Tuvai during the market day. We've been able to let people know about some of the things we're doing. Uh, and other different brands. So collaboration is also one way to get your brand out there uh, and build it and really create this kind of awareness. Great, great. Uh, thank you, Collins. Um, uh, you've talked about, uh, you know, how you know one would be a personal brand, but then I also want to take you back a bit. Uh, you talked about uh, where, for example, you learned some coding. You talked about Code Academy. There's a, if there's someone, you know, who, just has a huge interest, you know, in tech and software and coding and all that. Maybe they've been to school for it or not. What would be the best place as a software engineer right now, where you, from where you sit, 
what would be the best place you'd recommend someone to look for knowledge or look for coding uh, courses right now to, you know, up their game or just, you know, increase their value in this space? Yeah. Um, I think different people, uh, and I'll first emphasize this, different people have different ways of learning that work for them. I've come to learn this uh, through, the, through like my journey as a software engineer. Uh, for me, I enjoy reading while practicing, which is why Code Academy made sense for me. I enjoy getting my knowledge from reading something and then practicing it. So Code Academy is an amazing platform for, if, for you if you enjoy reading and exercises to get to learn something, right? Code Academy would be an amazing platform to you to get to learn technology. One, not only because they have amazing courses, but they have amazing fundamental courses. And I think that's what sets them apart for me. They have a fundamental on coding. They have a fundamental on technology as a general. And they have fundamentals on each of like these different languages. So for someone who loves reading while doing exercises, Code Academy is my best bet for you, along with maybe some Khan Academy. Now, for people who are more visual based, like you love or you enjoy learning something when someone's explaining it to you as you're seeing or as you're viewing, so you like watching videos to learn something, then I would recommend platforms like Udemy, platforms like Treehouse, platforms like Coursera. These are amazing for folks who enjoy visual learning and like to watch videos and can learn from those, right? Personally, I don't enjoy that because I feel like videos are My a man. prolonged way of... Rahmatullah. Sorry? From Bangladesh. Please. Yes, please. My name is Rahmatullah from Bangladesh. Yes, Robert. Uh, do you have a question? Thank you, everybody. Good evening. Good opportunity Good in technology and experience. Good. Is every member of my mm. account is a follow? Uh, okay, our, our friend from Bangladesh uh, seems to not be very clear. So I think he can maybe ask a question later on. Collins, please proceed. Sorry for yeah. the interruption. Okay. Yeah, so I saying for people who are very visual-based, uh, I'd say Udemy, Treehouse, and Coursera are amazing bets, right? Because you basically have all these videos that are teaching you these things uh, while you're sort of practicing. So in that regard, I would recommend that. Then there's also another category of folks who learn better through our community. And I think this is everyone in general. Like you learn better when you have someone else pretty much doing the same thing you're doing. So for such cases, then it's better that you enroll in schools like OutSchool, Refactory, and a bunch of these other places where you're basically having this community approach to learning. Uh, so yeah, those are the three uh, resources I'd share. And maybe uh, there are also a couple of others. Apart from OutSchool, I think there's also ALX. Um, not sure if ALX is also doing programming courses but i think they are so yeah so for a community-based approach those would be the best bits uh for someone to get into this and, and learn something or even yeah the last one is youtube for those who do youtube academy but i think the danger with youtube and learning from youtube for mostly someone who is a beginner is that it doesn't exactly uh piss piss this up for you right so you might land on a course or a video that is too that is feeding you too much and you just end up giving up on the journey because you're like, shit, this stuff is actually hard. Uh, these things are too complicated, so I can't get into this. So that's the concern with YouTube. You really can't know where to start from because these things are supposed to be paced on. Like as a beginner, maybe you start out by first doing a hello world or a hello statement. And with YouTube and some of these other places where there's no like categorization and, and pacing up of courses, it becomes hard and you just might end up giving up. Okay, thank you, Collins. Um, uh, thank you for what you shared. Uh, <clears throat> my my question, the my next question is, um, uh, from where you see it as 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 Collins, I'm sure you see so many young people, you know, in this in, in Kampala, but also you know across East Africa and Africa, that come up with applications, come up with different startups in the tech space. And most of the times, these things either look like what we see, you know, uh, for example, I once had a friend who started a messaging app that looked like 
WhatsApp. It's fantastic to see people do this because putting that code together and all that stuff is, you know, one one big job. But we also have so many other people coming up with this kind of applications or similar innovations. Why do you think these things don't end up breaking even or, you know, really becoming big and becoming platforms that people do use in their everyday lives to solve problems? And I'll give an example. We don't have so many things like Safe Border. Safe Border is part of people's daily lives now, like people use Safe Border on a daily. It, it solves their problem on a daily. Uh, so why do you think we don't have... Uh, why do you think most of this, these applications or similar innovations that young people are trying to do don't end up being as big as safe border or actually really solving the problems that we see around ourselves on a daily? Yeah, I think it comes out to the last statement that you actually mentioned while asking the question, is what you're building solving a constant problem, right? Um, and that's what a lot of these applications aren't actually doing. One, they're either not solving an actual problem or uh, considering an actual need within the people. Or second, they are not built up on fundamentals, right? And full disclosure, again, I think this is also something we've struggled with as WAPI as we've uh, continued building the company. Like, what exactly are we solving for? Who are we serving? And what do they really need? Sometimes as entrepreneurs, as software engineers, we're like all, all in in our heads and we're like, you know what? Hey, I'm going to get up in the morning. I'm going to build this application. It's going to have this feature. It's going to enable people to find a job by just thinking about it. It's going to enable people to find a job by even just saying, hey, I'm in Kampala and all these other things, right? So you're deluded, for lack of a better word, with this whole conception of the fact that people actually really need this. And you go out, spend years, spend money, spend months building out something. And when it comes to the market, like people aren't actually using this. It's simply because you had an assumption that was false. Mm -hmm. So what we're usually told and what I'm also constantly learning along with my co-founders is speak to your customers or speak to your users a lot, right? The book I would recommend, there's a book I would recommend for anyone who wants to understand whether what they're building is really needed is a book called The Mom Test. It's an amazing book about how to figure out whether people really need something. And why it's called the mom test is because usually when we want to start out something, we go and ask people, hey, for example, do you think you would want a platform that gets for you jobs? Do you think you don't have access to jobs? Uh, do you think it would be easier for you to get jobs if there was a platform like this that could help you get those jobs? And if you ask someone who is your mom those kind of questions, they would immediately say that, oh, yes, I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I absolutely think that would be good. Uh, yes, you should definitely build that because there's this whole idea of one, they don't want to let you down. But second, you've asked questions in a way that they allude to one answer by default, right? And the interesting thing about the mom test and how we should actually approach many of these questions is we should ask them from a point of informing and finding out rather than from a point of an opinion, right? So in such a case, what would be the better way to find out whether people actually need something before you build it is going and saying, Hey, how do you currently find jobs that you get? How long does it take you to get the current job that you have? Where did you find the current job that you have? What exactly did you need to do to prepare to get that job? So with the answers that you get from that, you're actually being informed on what exactly this person is looking out for rather than actually confirming what you're thinking, right? So in this case, you're finding out rather than informing or confirming. So that's one step that I definitely recommend why I think a lot of these applications aren't working. They're not solving an actual need that exists, but rather solving a need that exists within the uh, application creator's mind or within their theory of thinking that, hey, everyone needs this. Thank you, Colin. Um, <clears throat> uh, moving a bit to a general question. Uh, I think today, you know, we can't rule out the we we can't rule out the fact that almost every business or every organization you do have to interact with technology somewhere somehow. And um, I just want to understand, for example, you talked about the companies that you work for, uh, you know, in the US and all. <clears throat> um, how important is it today for you know young 
people building companies, startups, organizations? How is it how important is it for them to understand uh, technology and how they can interact with it to you know either increase their sales or increase the the size of their companies? And uh, how 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 um, how can 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 one for example because uh, let me give let, let me just make my question clear in this kind of way. Social media is technology, technology, and you go on there. You're using tech, you're using devices, and all that. People do a lot of marketing on there. But I want to understand now for personals work for big brands, and knowing how they actually use tech to advance their businesses or advance their organizations. Um, how important is it for young people to understand that, and how can they actually use technology? to advance their organizations, businesses, and their ideas. Yeah, I, I love the fact that you actually brought out social media through that. So tech can really be, even in the simplest terms, your phone, you using your phone. It can be in the simplest terms, you using your social media account. It can even be in the simplest terms, sometimes not something entirely associated with technology, uh, or oh, sorry, advanced technology, uh, but even sometimes just modern ways of, of fulfilling, fulfilling some things, right? Um, what I think people can do in that regard is trying out uh, the slightest things that could be related or that come up as a new technology trend, right? You don't need to entirely like give yourself your all to get into this, but like try to at least have the very basic knowledge. Uh, around different things right and how that can then be sort of useful is the biggest example which you've given again is social media is you realize that a lot of the founders today are building their companies because they have audiences that they've established on social media which comes back to the uh, brand thing that we were talking about earlier using technology which is social media to build out a brand and to build out a community that you then use to market your product and sort of create awareness around this uh, thing that you're selling. So that's area number one. The second I'd say is people shouldn't really be afraid of uh, getting themselves engrossed with technology, right? Because I think, and I, not I think, I know, and everyone pretty much knows that the future is definitely going to be written by technology. So for a lot of the people who now understand that uh, technology is important, you'll notice that in every workplace, at least you now need to have basic knowledge of using a computer, which wasn't a prerequisite before. For now, they're saying you need to know how to use a computer. Some workplaces has, have even gone a step further to say that you need to be able to use tools like Google Workspaces, uh, Microsoft Office, or many of these different tools. And as time goes on, the requirements keep advancing and keep increasing so it makes sense for you to then at least always have that basic understanding of many of these requirements before it gets too late right because your next big opportunity could be one that requires you to maybe have some experience using canva and how many of us have seen canva how many of us have used it how many of us have not so yeah be open be open-minded to trying out some of these new things uh, in their infancy, in their like most basic form, because you never know what that extra skill you have could get you. I know for one, I've used <laughs> languages that are very weird. For example, I've used one language called Liquid, which is only used by Shopify. But that language enabled me to land a gig one time that sustained me for like some good time. So yeah, that would be my advice: try out some of these new things in their most basic form, and at least have the skill rather than not. Thank you, Collins. Uh, and um, uh, from where you sit, Collins, and you know, with the experience you have so far and what you know, looking at the landscape of technology in general, software, and you know, the big industry it is, you know, worth over a trillion US dollars. And when you look at the US or you look at developed markets and how they interact with technology and how they create for us all these products we use, because I mean, we are having a Twitter space right now, but everything technically is from the US, you know, or just the bigger developed markets outside Africa. When you look at Africa today, when you look at Uganda, East Africa, what, what do you think is the future of technology for us? Shall we have a day when, you know, a kid born in Kawempe will create an application or a software 
platform that can be used all over the world or it's always going to be things from the developed world that then come here in Africa and then, you know, we, we use it. Shall we ever create stuff that can be used globally? I definitely think we can, and we already are, right? Uh, biz- biggest example that's closest to home is cheaper, cheaper cash. The second biggest is Eversend. Um, folks in Europe, folks in the USA are using Eversend and cheaper cash to make transactions. Uh, third other example is Flutterwave. Uh, despite all the controversies, Companies like Uber, companies like Booking.com, uh, and all these other different companies are using Flutterwave to actually carry out their transactions. These are these are softwares and platforms that were built within Africa, back on our home ground, and have grown from there. So I definitely think it's possible. It's something that's very possible. It's something that's happening. It's something that's going to constantly happen. And there's so many other examples that I might not have mentioned, right, that you get to constantly hear about. So... Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be possible and it is uh, going to happen. But I think it also has to happen when we have been very intentional about it. A lot of the times our platforms or tools aren't widely used because we build them with a scope that we want to build this for Uganda, right? And if you're building something for Uganda, definitely the audience that will be comfortable using it is Uganda. From the mindset of building our platforms and technologies, we need to have a bigger picture thinking of how big could this get? Be a dreamer. Dream as crazy as you would want to because there's honestly no harm in dreaming uh, sometimes. Uh, just, just for question, sometimes there's no harm in dreaming. But in most cases, when you're building technologies, there's no harm in thinking how big it could get because you'd be blown away when you actually realize what you thought could be as big and it happens. So... To get to that point, we also need to, one, think about how we are building world-class technology, but also actually build world-class technology. Go to things like user interfaces, user interactions. A lot of these can be gotten through the user interviews that we're talking about. Are you doing actual testing? Are you doing quality assurance? Uh, Are you having continuous development and continuous integration in a lot of the things that you're building? A bunch of these things that make the software that we're creating world-class, right, is what we need. It's something we can get to, but I, I think we just need to be very intentional about it. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. So we're in the winding up stages of our space. We shall be ending soon. Please ask a question if you have one. Uh, I have, I think, three more questions for Collins, and then, you know, we shall be winding up. So, Collins, uh, we have some culture questions here, and I think I'm getting into those. What are the two biggest challenges you face so far on your journey as a software uh, engineer, but also a young person, you know, building a startup like OP. What are the two biggest challenges you faced so far, and how have you been able to, you know, overcome them or try to work through them? Let's see. Um, I think the biggest challenge for me has been consistency and procrastination as 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 another uh, quantifier to that. Right, consistency once given can set you apart, uh, like I've said. And it's something that I've personally struggled with, but I am aware of, so I keep trying to work on. But what that means is that when you want to become the best person at what you do, you need to do it over and over and over and over and over and over again. Some people even go ahead to say like 10,000 hours or something to become a professional at what you do. And this fact will always stay true, right? You need to be able to do this over and over again. Starting out, it, it made no sense to me. But right now, I would say even sometimes when I'm just there seated, like you find me, oh, you, I'll just be thinking about, okay, cool, so yeah, there's this problem. Uh, how can I solve this with code, right? And I think that has come through continuous practice and doing something over and over again. While as I still continue to struggle with it because it's an ever-ending journey, it's one of my biggest struggles. So if you're out there and you feel like you're still struggling with consistency, I'd say it's something that you can work on. It's something that you can keep pushing towards becoming better at, and it shouldn't stop you from achieving what you want to do, right? The second thing uh, is really access to opportunities. Even given the fact that, yes, I have all these, I've worked with all these US companies, I think it's, I've I've just maybe sometimes been lucky uh, to get access to these opportunities, but there have been times where I haven't, been as lucky to have access to these opportunities. Uh, And I think that has mostly been seen while building WAPI. We apply for different things. We get to 
do all these amazing things or get to write these amazing applications, but you still just find yourself not getting in. And it's either because we do not have as much access to those opportunities or sometimes just because uh, you're from Africa or you're an African company or an African individual, the world has so many things stacked against you. So I think that's still something that stands out and that is a challenge. But again, it's a challenge now, but doesn't mean it will always be there forever. So as long as you don't give up, as long as you still keep in the fight, uh, there's one thing that will always try to come your way. Um, yeah, that's what I think. Thank you, Collins. Uh, if you've just joined the EAT space, we're talking to a man that came from Hawking and having six points at UACE to becoming a software engineer that works in uh, stations in Kampala but works globally for you know global companies. And he's building an interesting company, WAP, that's connecting talent to employers. And you know, you could ask a question if you have one or you know, say something. Uh, so I move on to my next question, Collins. <clears throat> What's the biggest advice you've had so far on your journey as a young person that has really worked for you and you'd want to share it today? Just one piece of advice. The biggest risk of all is not taking a risk at all, um, is what I would say. And what that simply means is it's the same as you really can't know until you've tried, right? So trying out and going ahead and doing things is the best way to learn um, and either get better at them or know better. So yeah, so that's my one piece of advice. The biggest risk of all is not taking a risk at all. Good. Uh, uh, yeah, I think <clears throat> my second last question, what's the biggest impact you'd hope to be remembered for as Collins Mbulachal? Uh, yeah, I think that's, that's, that's a good one, but I think it would have to be WAP, um, or decentralizing, no, no, that, that would be some, that's very, that's a very cliche way of saying it, but I'll just say it's, I want to be remembered for having created enough opportunities for people who don't have them. Um, that could be thought of in any way. It could be. Uh, and I've been also doing a lot of thinking around angel for angel investment now beyond just jobs, but it could be created opportunities for jobs, created opportunities for companies to get funded, created opportunities for people to learn technology. But yeah, that's what I want to be remembered for, uh, having given people the opportunities they need that they maybe couldn't have gotten before. Okay, thank you, Colin. Um... Then my last question, in the EAT space, we celebrate Africans and moving Africa. So who's that one African, one Ugandan or East African, could be anywhere from Africa or Uganda or East Africa, that one person that you know is moving Africa, that one person that you know is doing big things that you'd want to celebrate in your capacity as Collins? Yeah, uh, that's a really good one. I think... There are two people, and, and I'm sorry to say, but yeah, there are just two people. It, it's not just one. Uh, one of them is Vosi from South Africa. I think Vosi is like one of the, oh, God, if I like, if I get to meet him, it's, it's, it's like really up there. Vosi is doing amazing work um, in the VC space, in the entrepreneurship space, in the speaking space. He's like one of the best uh, entrepreneurs out there that you could ever meet at least from my point of view and i just love the knowledge he shares and how exactly he does it the second one would be the founder of the africa leadership group right uh, and i luckily got to meet him earlier this year when i was in rwanda uh, i met him at alu and yeah it's 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 just phenomenal the work he has also done within the education space within the job space within basically the space of giving Africans an opportunity to compete in a world-class kind of stature. So I greatly applaud the work he has done. Um, and yeah, those are the two people I'd say I, I, I have mad respect for. Thank you, Collins. Uh, just one question I couldn't leave out. I, I'm going to ask the question, then I think I'll invite Irene to ask you know one or two things, and we shall truly close up the space. If you have something to say, you can request to speak, or you can just you know write in the comments. We shall ask Collins before we we let him go. So Collins, uh, 
My last question is about funding. Uh, as a person that's building a startup, you know how funding, how important funding is. In the developed markets, we have venture capital firms, we have angel investors, and you know, people have access to funds to, you know, uh, build up their dreams. How would you? How do you? How do you think? How do you think we can solve the funding challenge we have down here in East Africa? Or, oh, you know, if you already know the problem is being solved, how can young people building startups or having huge dreams access funds to actually make those things a reality? Yeah, I think, and I, I've talked about this a lot with uh, other entrepreneurs through conversations, is creating local capital, right? We have a, and this may, be, this may not be thought of as true, but we actually have a lot of money as Africans, uh, or as Ugandans or as East Africans, but we choose to invest a lot of this money in things like farming, in things like uh, shops, in things like I'm going to buy a plot of land and all these other things. Not that it's bad, but I think we need to diversify how we are spending and investing. So how I think we can make this capital accessible is by convincing the money holders or the people that have this money to be more, di more diversified and start to actually invest in either startups or invest in technology and have that happen uh part of what we are doing or what i'm actively doing right now is working with a couple of other entrepreneurs and other people who are trying to get into angel investment to see that that money actually comes through because i've experienced this firsthand through api failing to access capital failing to access funding and i think it's a big problem that's hindering a lot of the success that would come from our uh companies and our entrepreneurs so taking the mantle onto ourselves and actually actively being able to do this. What does that mean for any of you who is on this Twitter space? It means that if you have your friend who is starting a startup, if you have your friend who is starting a business, we love to be the first to celebrate all these other things. Uh, we love to celebrate birthdays. We love to celebrate baby showers. We love to take out folks for drinking. But I want us to also be able to go ahead and celebrate a friend who starts a business and like be like, oh, you've started a business. How can I invest in you? How can I give you 500000 which is roughly the equivalent of $150? I have my $150, I have my $100, I have my $50. How can I invest them in your business? All it takes is that. Because you'll find that most of these successful entrepreneurs outside there are being invested in by first and foremost their friends and family. So we need to create more local capital. We need to create more local capacity. And that way, we then have the money and the success stories bring back into our ecosystem and we go, get to grow together. Thank you, Collins. Irene, can you, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Sure, you, you could ask your, your question uh, before we, we close. <clears throat> or um, should I, I go I, ahead? I think yeah, you should. Yeah. Okay, good So, uh, uh, guys, uh, if you've been part of the space till this time, we thank you for being part of the space. And the man Collins is still here. You know, he's a millionaire. When he leaves this place, you may not get a chance to <laughs> ask him anything. But, um, yeah, you could ask a question. You could ask a question uh, or, you know, you could share it in the comments. Otherwise, um, this is the EAT space. We do this every 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 Thursday. And you know we're having conversations in the social and we are uh, having conversations about social and economic topics shaping the future of East Africa and Africa. And we believe it's important to have these conversations because you know we all challenge ourselves to be and do better. And just like what Collins has shared, a lot of knowledge. I'm sure we have learned something. We have, we have been challenged that you know we should do things. And we also get hope because if Collins can do it, then you can do it. It could be in a tech space. It could be in any other industry that you're in. But if there's a guy called Collins that you know moved from Hawking to being a software engineer, he's shared the principles like discipline that you know has pushed him to where he is then you can too you just have to think big and work hard yeah so we're going to wind up the space i don't see any questions uh we're going to uh, we're going to uh close up collins um uh, your parting shots before we close uh, your parting shots you want to hear your parting shots then i think also Irene will give hers and then we shall call it tonight all right sure thing um so yeah Parting short would one be to say thank you 
Kaskazini, uh, thank you, Irene. Thank you for hosting the space and having me on it. Uh, honestly, very humbled. And beyond that, to the people in this space, uh, two things. One, again, take that risk. Take that thing. Learn it. Try it out. Uh, there's this famous meme of mess around, find out, right? So, yeah, try out different things. Uh, give yourself a chance to learn more and add to yourself as an individual. But second, let's embrace steak. Uh, let's be open to it. Let's try to get it into everything that we do today because the future is definitely going to be technology. So you stand more to gain by learning than fearing it. Thank you, Collins. I think you have a question from my brother, Amanya Ivan. Amanya, you can speak. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Collins, for the sharing. I've liked it so much. Mine is not a question, but I want to say thank you for for there's something that stood out for me so much. That part of uh, local funding, it's so amazing that when we get some money from our jobs, all we think of is maybe making a small retail somewhere, making like a tiny shop in that in town or those 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 things we normally do. And it's very funny. Those things actually they make money for we the people who invest in them, but they don't make money for the community. They are actually uh, a waste of money. So I like that idea. If my friend begins a business, if my friend begins a small startup, my first question should be, how can I help you build this? How can I help you uh, maybe invest, find fund, find funding for, for your business? Yeah, I like it too much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Amanya. Uh, Irene, your parting shots, and then we shall close the space. Thank you. Um, I'd like to say thank you to Collins for, you know, sharing his extensive um, information, but also the most inspiring story I've had today. Um, I would like to also thank everyone for joining the conversation. Usually we do this every week, so please catch up catch up with us next week we're coming with something new something different i guess so yeah thank you and yes yeah, so thank you everyone this is a recorded space if you joined late uh you can listen to the recorded space it will be on twitter and i think we shall upload it on uh, uh, our youtube next week so you can catch up with the conversation in case you missed anything otherwise thank you everyone for the time and thank you so much mr collins uh, I hope that uh, you can live to, you know, realize the biggest impact you'd want to be remembered for and also just to applaud you for the good work that you, you're doing. You're not only uh, doing it for yourself, but you're inspiring so many young people across Uganda, across East Africa, across Africa as well. And um, Wapi, Wapi is doing great stuff as well, you know, and I hope that, I think we shall be talking to Natasha soon, so she will share more about Wapi. And it's a great opportunity for many young people to actually access, you know, employment, access opportunities. And yeah, keep doing what you do, my brother, and hope to have another conversation with you because it's a lot that we actually haven't been able to get from you because the time is limited. But surely we shall invite you again next time and, you know, be able to share more. Otherwise, Asante Sana, and thank you, everyone. Uh, have, have a good night. I think there's a question here. Let me just see. Uh, I think we're good to go. Yeah, guys, good night. Asante. Asante.